All right, welcome to the Twitchy Theologian. I am your host, the Twitchy Theologian, aka the Family Dollar James White. I am here today with Nathan Anderson, none other than Mr. Postmill himself. Uh, y'all gonna hear some real good stuff today. Uh, here is Nathan Anderson. Nathan, introduce yourself, brother. Hey, Jerry, how's it going? Thanks for inviting me on. Um, yeah, my name is Nathan Anderson. I am a filmmaker based out of Pichilemu, Chile in South America here. And yeah, I made some films on post millennialism and uh, served down here in our local church. And I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, and we're, we are definitely uh, glad to have you. It's an a honor to have you on. Um, your movie, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, uh, I, I watched it w around the time when I first started embracing post-millennialism. And I remember towards the end, as the, the Psalms were, were being read, you know, he shall have dominion from sea to sea, from the rivers to the ends of the earth. I was crushed and just started weeping. And there were times where I would just lay in bed and fall asleep listening to that over and over and over. So I really appreciate it. Awesome, brother. Thank you. Yeah, it's been amazing to talk to a lot of people who have seen the movie and have, you know, at least been introduced to the whole concept. And and because I, obviously I don't expect you know just one movie to be enough to be like, oh, OK, here's everything you ever need to know about postmillennialism and on the, in this subject. But it is, you know, enough at least to get people um, willing to dive into the issue and maybe consider a few things. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so the rumors are, are not true. I read on Facebook that you had um, become Amil. Are those rumors true or no? Yeah, I I've, I've, have not um, seen anything about that. I, I haven't in, even been informed that I became Amil. So, um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the rumors of, of, of my demise have been exaggerated for sure. So I am not all male. I am very much post mill. That's right. That post mill. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, yeah. So I would encourage people uh, to to go and watch that movie on Earth as it, as it is in heaven. You have another um, documentary on, on lore, right? Uh, what yes. was the name? Teaching. What was it called? <clears throat> yes, I have another docu series. So it's a five part series called Teach All Nations that is available. On, on lore and um, uh, you guys could watch that through through that portal and also I'm, I'm hoping in the near future to maybe make that a bit more white more widely available as well teach all nations but I'm also um, finishing and working on a uh, another film that's called honor the sun and that's coming out um, probably in the next few weeks so I'm very excited to share that with everyone as well uh, quickly, can you give us a quick description of Honor of the Sun and like basically the, the premise behind it? Yes. Yeah, so um, what I tried to do with both with Teach All Nations and Honor of the Sun is kind of um, continue down that rabbit trail of, of, of post millennialism in terms of some of the practical applications. If we believe that um, Jesus <clears throat> Is, is ruling and reigning today and that his kingdom is growing and expanding and it will eventually fill the whole earth, right? If we believe all those things to be true, then what kind of implications does that have for our, our daily lives? Because obviously, you know, just if it's just a theory about end times and, you know, this, you know, some of the details of, of certain prophetic fulfillments, then that's kind of interesting, but it's maybe not all that important. But really, postmillennialism deals with, um, with the aspect of the nature and expectation we should have for the kingdom of God as it pertains to this age and this earth. And so um, a lot of the what I'm trying to do with, um, with uh, like Teach All Nations and Honor the Sun is deal with some of those questions. And um, so with Honor the Sun specifically, uh, I'm trying to deal with a, a bit of the intersection between faith and politics. And, um, you know, from this post-mill worldview, what does it 
uh, what is the role of politics in the life of the Christian and how we should view uh, and whether we should even engage in some way in the political realm as Christians. So I really try to go and, you know, kind of to some of the basic um, issues and assumptions that we should have. And I got to talk to a lot of really great um, theologians that were also, you know, post-bill, uh, Jill Moorcraft, um, and uh, and who else? Uh, Joe Joe Webbin was on there. Yeah, Joe Webbin, Joe Boot. Uh, yeah. Talked to Vishal Manglawadi, who's written some great material in terms of the impact of the on the of the Bible on the in the Christian world. Um, yeah. Was it uh, Luke Pearson was on there? Luke I can't Pearson remember if Jeff was on, was on there. Was Jeff on there? Jeff wasn't on this one. He is on Teach All Nations though. But okay. Luke was uh, was in this one, and um, yeah, a lot lot of great guys. Doug Wilson, uh, and was in. Of course, there. you got to have Uncle Doug on yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not a post meal movie unless you got Uncle Doug on there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, yeah, no, it's it, it was you know great experience to be able to film that and 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 work on that and um uh, and yeah so i'm hoping to release it in the next few weeks and and yeah very excited for people to be able to watch that so right now i'm basically doing kind of a funding uh campaign for it and my idea is just to try to raise some funds to recoup some of the costs production costs and you know flying from south america to to the states and filming and all that you know and um, uh, and then just release it as far and wide as I can. So it's gonna probably I'm probably release it to YouTube and um, possibly a few other platforms as well. So yeah, I'm very excited about that, and it should be out in the next few weeks. Nice. And uh, what we'll do is uh, afterwards, if you'll if you'll give me the link to where they can then fund that, uh, I'll post it in the description. You guys, I, I, I please. I request that that you would go so support that this uh i believe I, i've watched this this video and it was very encouraging to me and uh, i believe it will be used by god to help uh change change the world really um and if i could if i could summarize it i would say psalm chapter two mm -hmm. psalm psalm two just read psalm two you'll you'll get the gist behind what this is about and uh, you, you want to watch it. Trust me, you want to watch it. Um, real quick, I didn't realize that uh, we haven't even defined what we're talking about. Now, there are people. See, I am from the uh, mountains of, of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the land of, of liver mush and cheer wine, right? Instead of the land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're in the the land of the hillbillies, so we may not understand this this fancy fancy terminology. Could you define post mill for us? Yeah, so um, post millennialism is, I mean, the, you, we talk about three major views in terms of eschatology: post millennialism, pre millennialism, and amillennialism. And you know, we, well, we could define premillennialism as the idea that Jesus is going to return before this period of this millennium that's mentioned and described in, in Revelation chapter 20. Um, so that Jesus is going to return and then this millennium is going to begin. And then after that millennium, you have, you know, the final judgment and the eternal state and all that stuff. Uh, all millennialism is awe, you know, is the idea of no millennium basically. And, and so it's like the word agnostic, you know, or, or atheism or, or, you know, the, the, the awe in, in, uh, is, is used in the, the negative in that sense. So no millennium millennium. So it's basically the negation of this idea that there, there is a millennium and, you know, they either, they either limit that millennium to heaven or they limit it to the heart of, of believers, but there's no earthly millennium is kind of the, the general notion and post-millennialism is the idea that Christ returns after the millennium, basically. And so, um, and, and, and probably the biggest uh, um, distinctive is an, a general expectation of the victory in history of, of the gospel, the victory of Christ's church. The gospel is going to be proclaimed in all the nations and not just proclaimed, but actually the nations are going to embrace 
the gospel and they're going to come to Christ and they're going to change their their lives in every aspect of their life to come and conform to God's word and to scripture. And, and, and it's not going to be for five minutes. It's going to be a long extended period of time where the nations are going to enjoy the blessings of, of, of serving the Lord. And after that long period, Christ is going to return. So that's kind of the general uh, framework that we have in, in the, in the post-millennial perspective. Yeah. And one thing uh, that, that I want to uh, kind of hit on, you were talking about how uh, the nations will, 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 will come to God like in, in mass, basically. Um, I, I would refer our listeners to Isaiah chapter two, where it says in the last days, uh, they'll all come up to God's mountain. Uh, well, why are they coming up? I would say because they're being drawn, uh, uh, you know, I'm a reformed guy. And so, uh, you know, when God draws, uh, that's effectual. Um, and John chapter 12, Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men, unto myself. And that's what we are currently seeing Christ drawing all men, uh, to himself, uh, all the nations coming up to the mountain of God. Yeah. And, and if I could add, there's, you know, maybe I'm, I'm jumping the gun here a bit, but, um, I think one thing that's really important to me or that I find very compelling about the post-millennial perspective, it has to do with what we believe is the power of the gospel, Right. And it is the gospel in and of itself sufficient to transform the nations. And I think that is somewhere that, uh, unfortunately, um, our brothers who, um, uh, who hold to other positions, um, you know, ultimately have to say, no, the gospel is not powerful enough, right? Because um, the, of what they believe in terms of Bible prophecy. Uh, or they can maybe say, well, we think it potentially could be powerful enough, but God just didn't want it that way or something like that. Be because ultimately, if we believe that the church is in the world empowered by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, then we have to come to, to grips with the, the, the notion that um, why would Christ send us into the world to disciple the nations? Why would there, there be all these amazing promises in Scripture about the nations coming uh, to Zion and 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 learning the word of the Lord and being taught by 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 God's people, and then that bringing about peace among the nations? Why would we have all these kinds of of promises if the nations are in fact not going to embrace the gospel? Basically, and something that I think is very important that we find in terms of the establishment of God's kingdom is that, and we see that in Isaiah chapter two, it's not something that is imposed from the top down on, on, on the nations. And in the premillennial scheme of things, and even in the amillennial scheme of, of things, it actually is because the, the nations aren't going to change their ways until Christ comes from heaven with a large heavenly army and he imposes his reign over them by force, right? That's the only way that the nations aren't going to change, really. You know, there might be some level of, of, of evangelism and success, but in general, they're going to oppose Christ until he comes and, and, and lays down the hammer, basically. And so it's, it really is an idea where, no, it, the only way that there is going to be transformation is if if Christ, you know, militarily imposes his kingdom on the world, and only then will they come to him. But that's not what we see in Scripture. That's not what we see in Isaiah chapter 2. And we, as you just uh, very well mentioned, the nations flow and seek out Zion. They seek out the people of God, and they want to be taught, you know, and Isaiah 42, the coastlands are waiting for his law. You see that again. And another verse I really like is, is Psalm uh, 110. Uh, let me look for that real quick. Psalm 110. And specifically, you know, we can talk about verse one is very interesting. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And, and then verse two, it says, the Lord set forth from Zion your mighty scepter rule in the midst of your enemies. And so right there we have something interesting where Christ's rule 
does not begin when everything is all perfect and you know everything is subdued. It begins in the midst of his enemies, right? So so um uh, so right there, you can discard the premillennial notion where you know Christ only begins to reign when he subdues all of his enemies, and and that's when his reign kind of starts. No, here we see that he rules in the midst of his enemies. But then look what verse three says says, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power, right? Your people will offer themselves freely. And so that is, that's, I think that should be very confusing to someone who comes from a pre-mill or even an all-mill perspective, because it is saying that the way God is going to accomplish his purpose uh, with his people is not simply by, you know, imposing it militarily, but his people are going to freely come to him, right? And obviously we know that people don't freely come to God unless the Father draws them, right? And so uh, it's very interesting uh, when you consider that the scripture very clearly seems to indicate that the way this world in history is going to be transformed is not through a top-down imposition, but by uh, people being drawn to the to, to God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, ultimately. And so I think that is a very important, um, a very important point as it relates to post-millennial eschatology. Yeah, Amen. Uh, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And uh, Isaiah tells us His word won't return void. It will. It will set out what He has purposed it to do. So when we're we're out spreading the gospel, uh, it's gonna uh, do what He wants. Wants it's gonna accomplish its purpose, which. God tells us is to uh, disciple the nations in mm -hmm. Matthew 28. And I would also point people, I think people miss this, um, the parable of the soils. I mean, who's the, the sower there? Well, well, the sower there is, is Jesus Christ. He's, he's, he is uh, sowing his seed. And look, in the beginning, there was some who just didn't grab it. Uh, you know, 75% of them missed it, right? That's what the parable is kind of saying. But, for those who did get it, they'll bear fruit some 30, 60, and 100 fold. And then when you continue on in those parables, uh, then you get to the the real good stuff. Mm -hmm. But before I get there, um, let's for for the people arguing, well, you know, if we believe that the the um, we believe that the kingdom of God is is future. What if what passage would you point them to to indicate that no 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 this is a present reality the 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 kingdom of God is is now Christ well, is reigning I, now I mean there's many passages I'd point them to I'd begin with Matthew twenty eight verse what is it verse eighteen all authority has been given to me on heaven in heaven and on earth so right there that's you know, if Christ has received all authority in heaven and on earth, game over. He's king now, and he's king overall. And then, you know, uh, you know, other texts of scripture build off of that. So, like Ephesians chapter one, you know, verse verse twenty one, you know, uh, or, or, or verse twenty, that worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And so, I mean, that kind of, that seems to settle it. He's seated. I mean, what, what else does it mean to rule? <laughs> I mean, right. It, and it, then it, you it, quoted Psalm 110, one, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, your footstool for your feet. And then you mm -hmm. cross reference that was uh first Corinthians 15, yeah, uh, you know, if it, the last enemy to be defeated is death. He shall reign until all his enemies are put under his feet and all that. It seems clear to me. And, um, and then, you, you know, another verse along with that that is very interesting is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, because it, it applies that text as well. And it says, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins he sat down at the right hand of god waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet and so that's something very interesting because it it very clearly points out that christ 
what you know he sacrificed a single sacrifice for all time and then he sat down at the right hand of god and he's waiting for his enemies to be footstooled and so what we see there is that the enemies will not be footstooled at his second coming because he's waiting there at the right hand of god for his enemies to be footstooled you know why would he be waiting if he's the one who has to come down and footstool them personally you know as as many uh, Christians believe today. And so uh, I, I think it's very interesting when you when you see how Hebrews 10 applies it, um, that no, that in fact, uh, it, his enemies are footstooled in history. And then when you when you jump to you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, like you were mentioning, that becomes even more clear that that is the order of, of thing. He must reign. Right until all of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet, and so it, it they they are footstooled in during the reign of Christ that began two thousand years ago. Amen. And another one, I think, when we're preaching the gospel, um, I know that we uh, focus on individual uh, salvation, but I think that uh, something that we miss that is a part of the gospel is that Christ is uh, reconciling the world to himself. And we, and we don't often mention the ascension, hmm. um, but, but to kind of, uh, you know, jump off of, of what you were saying, uh, Daniel seven uh, verses uh, nine through 13 and 14. I'll just read verse 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days. So we see the son of man coming to the ancient of days. So I'm seeing that as the ascension. The son of man yeah. is coming up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Now get this. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I mean, I'm looking at, at Daniel 2 as well, at the timing of that. Um, you know, there's the four, there's the statue with the, the four different types of metals. metals. Yeah. Could, do you, could you explain that one? Because I'm, I'm losing my mind here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, and I'll also just emphasize here in Daniel 7, right, that the Son of Man is coming with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. It's not... He's not, as you said, he's not descending, he's ascending because, because, you know, that the ancient of days is God, the father, and he's in heaven, right? He's not on earth. And so the son of man coming to the ancient of days, and he's given this, this eternal uh, uh, dominion ultimately. And then right in Daniel chapter two, we have these, these four uh, different uh, metals, right? And I'm a, uh, and it, what is it in the days of these kings? Is that where, where what verse is that? That is um, uh, where he basically sees. 44. Uh, ver verse 44. Yeah. In the days of those kings, the king of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And just as you saw the stone cut from the holy mountain by no human hand, and that it broke to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, a great God has made known the thing to the king, what shall happen after this. And so it basically, um, in the, and this is important, in the days of those kings. So when is this going to happen? And who are the, the four metals? Well, it, it very clearly, you know, the four metals, are you know begins with the uh, Babylon, Babylon, Medo Persia, the, yeah, then the the Medo Persia, and then the Greeks, Greek, and then the Romans, yeah. and in the days of those kings, right? Because it mentions you know the feet and all that, and some people try to separate the feet and say, oh well, this was, uh, you know, this was something different, but it doesn't mention five kingdoms; it mentions four kingdoms, and that's so right. that's just a very basic issue of interpretation. It's it's it is the same fourth kingdom in the days of those kings in the days of the roman kings and the roman caesars that's when the kingdom of god breaks forth 
and this stone you know that hits the 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 statue and breaks it to pieces then grows to fill the whole earth right and so it's it's very clearly is something that begins in the first century right it's not the kingdom of god doesn't begin at some other time and now we're, you know, we're not the only ones who, who believe that. I mean, all millennialists definitely will believe, yeah, the kingdom of God began in the first century. The problem is they believe the kingdom of God is veiled and that it, it you know, it, it began, he's reigning, but but not really. He's reigning in the this spiritual sense or in the hearts of his people, but he's not really reigning out there in the world you know that's not really his thing these days you know that's more for the second coming or the eternal state and so uh so that's an important difference and and also we have to recognize that in the post-millennial interpretation um also because obviously we don't believe that you know jesus came the kingdom of god began and the next day everything you know was just just wonderful it, it's a process. And so we see even that stone hitting the 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 kingdoms and, and filling the whole earth, like in the vision that happens, like in the blink of an eye, I guess. But in reality, and in it, it happens slowly in history. And that's not just an excuse we're making up. Jesus himself explained that his kingdom was, uh, the nature of his kingdom was like a, a mustard seed that starts out small. And grows until it, it becomes a great tree and the birds of the air uh, nest in it and, and all of this. And so uh, so that's how Jesus described his kingdom, right? And and ironically, that's not the kingdom the, the pre-mills describe. Because the, the kingdom they describe does come in the blink of an eye. It comes when Christ returns with a heavenly army. And, you know, five seconds later, he's king of the world. And... And, um, uh, and and that's so they really do have that vision, which I believe is in conflict with Jesus's teaching about the mustard seed, ultimately. And so that's why I think postmillennialism is the view that describes best the nature of the kingdom in this world, because we don't believe it's just this ethereal thing that he kind of reigns, but not really. Um, and we don't believe it's just future. We believe that it is gradually in history being manifest as the gospel goes forth as the the as as the gospel's preached and people come to Christ day by day week by week you know lord's day by lord's day uh the world is being changed and the world is being transformed and so it is a gradual process that will lead to disciple nations ultimately Right. And I think I can't remember where this is at, but um, going back to the birds of the, the air nesting in it, I think it might be in like Ezekiel 31 or somewhere where it refers to Babylon in that way, where that, you know, the Babylonian Empire was covering the whole known mm -hmm. earth at that time. And uh, so what Jesus is doing is he's saying just as the Babylonian Empire covered the earth, I think it was the Babylonian Empire. So shall my empire uh cover the earth uh, i was looking it up as you were speaking but um yeah that's possible i haven't i haven't heard that but um uh, but yeah they that i mean the at, the at the very least what i'm seeing there is is jesus saying the nature of his kingdom is it's a slow growing kingdom it's not right. a it's not a pop-up kingdom that that just appears you know from one moment uh to the next in that sense. And so I think, uh, I think Dougie fresh says it like this. It doesn't drop out of the sky like the 82nd airborne. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and then, so we've talked about like when the kingdom is, and we're talking about the nature of one more that I would reference, um, uh, is, uh, Matthew 12. This is where I love taking people to, um, Matthew 12, uh, Jesus quotes Isaiah 42, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, let, me, let me go there so that I don't misspeak. Um, 
So uh, God's chosen servant, um, starting in verse 18, or we'll start in 17. This was to feel, fulfill uh, what the, you know, he's talking about him healing and all that. Mm -hmm. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is pleased. I'll put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry loud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench. So that's what you're saying that. Yeah. Almost imperceivable, imperceptible um, reign of Christ where, where it's coming about so gently that not even a bruised reed he would break and a reed being the uh, little mm. things that stick up out of a, a pond. They're easy to snap, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even so, a bruised reed, he won't break it because it's so imperceptible. And it says until he brings justice to victory and in his name, the Gentiles will hope. Mm -hmm. And then, then later on, and, and I'm going to be quick with this later on, they're, they're uh, kind of challenging Jesus. The, they come to him and say he's casting out demons by the uh, spirit of Satan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, uh, you know, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. Uh, he says, uh, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Mm -hmm. um, and then Luke, he says, the kingdom is in your midst. So what I'm seeing here, uh, we, we definitely know Jesus was casting out demons by the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So the kingdom of God is, is upon us and speaking to the nature of the kingdom, as you were saying, then you go into Matthew 13, 33, which is like one of my all time favorite verses. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into it. I'm gonna, let me get to the ESV. Uh, the, the NIV throws me off. The, the king, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leaven. So here's the kingdom of heaven, this little bit of leaven, and here's all this dough. Jesus puts it in there and he says it's mixed in. And, and the dough is the world until all of it yeah. is leavened. The, the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom is like that mountain or like that rock that turns into a mountain. It, it, it grows to cover the earth. Yeah. And, and to me, it's it's so crazy that, and 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 if you've seen and and experienced the transformation of the gospel brings in your own life, and you've seen it in in other people's life. I mean, I was just at church yesterday talking to some some people that were coming to church for the first time, and some and a young man who I've you know known for a long time who hasn't been walking with the Lord, but he, you know, he came to church and we were talking and. It's just amazing to see what God does in people's lives, you know, and it's so encouraging. And to say, yeah, that's amazing, but it's not enough. And really, Jesus is going to have to come back to to really bring about that change. It's it's a little odd. You know, it's a little I, I think you it's, it, you have to kind of compartmentalize, um, you know, to come to that kind of conclusion and really the only excuse people try to give with that is say well as they say well you guys are just carnal you know you guys just expect victory in this world because you're carnal and you you think that by your own efforts you know the kingdom of god is going to come about when in, and in fact only god only god can bring the kingdom of god only jesus being present on earth can change things is what what they say so often but then we go, wait a second, that doesn't really comport with what Jesus himself said. He said, it is better that I go, right? Because I'm going to send you the helper. The Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is in the world and he's leading the charge, right? He is leading God's people to victory. And, and so why, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Every Orthodox Christian claims to believe that. But for some reason, we're under the impression that the Holy Spirit is not enough when it comes to the transformation of the world. That, that you know, that for, for some reason, we need to have the second person of the Trinity, not the third person of the Trinity, on earth with us for the world to be really changed, you know? And so it's an, it's a very odd notion uh, that, that, that um, 
I think um, clashes with so much of what we see in the scriptures. And but it's hard for people to even uh, take a step back to even begin to consider and see some of these things. And so that's why we, you know, usually talking about post millennialism is post millennialism is not a short three minute conversation because there's a lot of assumptions and ideas, especially people that have been involved with Christianity for a long time. Because I've talked to people that, have, you know, that just became Christian and they don't know about all this stuff. And you explain post millennial, they're like, okay, uh, sure. You know, like, I mean, uh, you, know, um, you know, Kanye West might not be the the best example uh, after everything that happened. But even in one of his songs, it was like, you know, everyone I will tell until the whole world is safe. You know, there's a little line in, in one of his songs. And it's just so basic. It's like, yeah, we we experienced the gospel. It's powerful. It it transformed our lives. It transforms other people's lives. Of course, it's going to change the world. What do you expect? And so that's that's something that uh, that we really have to come back to, I feel, in evangelical Christianity in this day and age, uh, because it wasn't always like that. I mean, if you, if you go back a few hundred years, postmillennialism was the dominant perspective in North America and, you know, it's first great awakening and all that that period. And so but we've we've hit this um, pessimistic slump over the last few hundred years and um, and and just over this last period where premillennialism and amillennialism have really grown and and people have forgotten a bit about this optimistic view of history. Yeah, certainly and I appreciate you touching on the history there because I think that's really important um you know as as someone who lives in the United States uh, people need to understand that America was founded on two things Calvinism and postmillennialism mm -hmm. the guys who came over were postmill guys um wanting to 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 be the um that city on a hill. I can't remember who it was who preached that sermon. I've read it, but he wanted to be uh, America to be the city on a hill. And um, I think we need to get back to that instead of this, uh, you know, the left behind books. Yeah. That, that's basically where people are getting their theology instead of scripture and continuing on with the history. People don't understand. This has been all throughout the church. People have held to what we're saying. The dispensationalism, that is very, very new. Uh, John Darby created it in what? Night? 1830s. Yeah. 19th and century. then we got guys like Athanasius clearly teaching the post mill hope in uh, some of his writings. Uh, I read uh, some of his writings in Ken Gentry's book, mm -hmm. He Shall Have Dominion. And I'm like, dude, I can't believe that this has been taught for that long and people don't know about it. Yeah, I mean, I well, a few points there. Like um, my view in terms of post-millennialism in church history, um, I I'm, I think it, it is very easy to fall into a lot of reading things back into history with with a lot of these these issues and and that actually is very common with all millennialism because you you hear all the time that all millennialism was the view of the church throughout history well all millennialism is a term that was invented you know in the in the 1900s pretty much in the 19th century uh, actually and and so you know, if you you would have asked these guys, you go back 800 years, and you ask, are you all millennial? They wouldn't really know what you're talking about. And so we have to be careful. And, and I would give the same cautious to cautious to to post millennials. So like you read someone like Athanasian and you're right. Like he says something, he talks about, you know, the light coming to the Gentiles and the pagan, like every day he says, you know, the light grow of Christ grows in the world and the idols fall. And like, he sounds very post-millennial, but then you read another thing of Athanasian. He's like, yeah, and the Antichrist is rising up in our times. I think it's this guy. And so, so I think history is very, uh, very much, very mixed. And, and a lot of people had very weird ideas about eschatology and so when you go back and you read a lot of these individual guys throughout like history, um, they don't always line like people try to say, oh, this was my guy. This guy was my guy. But 
when you actually go back there, like, yeah, it was a little more complicated than that. People had a lot of very interesting ideas about, you know, eschatology and, um, but what you can say is like, you go back in history is like there was, there was this, you know, this comp, this kind of category of childist or, or millenarians and non-millenarians or, you know, childist and non-childist. So, um, so that is a category. And so you have, you know, you have premillennialists, even, you know, in the early centuries of the church, guys like Irenaeus and Tertullian and, and other guys like that. But even then Tertullian mentions in one of his writings that, no, in fact, like, yeah, I'm a pre -mill, I'm pre-mill. I believe that this will be, uh, but there's other Christians, you know, of the, the, of pure, you know, basically of the pure faith that disagree with me. And so, so we see that in the early centuries and then we get, see guys like Augustine and 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 different folks like that that uh, you know some of their views line up with post mill some of their views seem to line up with with all mills uh, you know so then then you have a, 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 a another interesting guy who's Joaquin de Fiore who's in the uh, in in kind of the medieval period um, he actually, you know, on a side note, he, he had an encounter with Richard the Lionheart, you know, talking about biblical prophecy with him, you know, back in the time of the Crusades and all that. Uh, but he had this view of history that divided it into three eras, basically, uh, you know, the, the era of the father with the Old Testament, the era of the son, and then the era of the Holy Spirit. And so he had an expectation that, you know, there would be this future... Um, kind of period of blessing on the earth. And, and Joaquin, it's interesting because his exegesis was actually very influential in the Reformation. And so guys like Martin Luther would read, read his commentary and, um, uh, and, and, and stuff like that. And so Bruce Gore has a great lecture on, on this whole topic on when he talks about historicism. He mentions a lot of this, but, but basically I would say when, when you, when you get to, you know, the Puritans and you get to, you know, a number of these other folks, um, that really is where post-millennialism, that, that really is the heyday of post-millennialism. And a lot of these guys have this expectation and very clearly the, 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 the guys that came here to, that came to North America had that expectation, you know, and, and saw, uh, you, you know, had we're, we're expecting the 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 blessings uh, of the latter days to come about in in time and in history, and so that's where you you read guys like uh, George Whitfield, like he was very clearly post millennial, one of the greatest preachers of in history. Um, you you read guys like um, yeah Jonathan Edwards, and then you know you read also the. Uh, the great theologians of, of Princeton, you know, Warfield and Charles Hodge and Alexander Hodge and uh, just so many of these guys reflected this post-millennial hope. And it was and it's interesting because even in one of his sermons, like George Whitfield describes post-millennialism and he says, and this is the, the general expectation amongst the people of God. That's a phrase he uses. And, and so he's, he's not, it's not like he's this fringe, you know, guy who's talking about these weird things. He's saying, he's just repeating what everybody else believes at, at his time. You know, that's pretty much what everyone's saying. There's, there's this general expectation that, you know, in the future, the church is going to be victorious and all these blessings promised in scripture are going to come about, you know? And so, um, and so that's where it really becomes interesting when we talk about North, like the United States is, you know, post-millennialism is as American as George Washington, you know. And uh, and actually, you know, uh, Peter Lilliback has a very interesting lecture on George Washington and on his faith and everything. And on, amongst the many other things he mentions in there is he says, well, actually, George Washington was post-mill. <laughs> he finds some passages where, where George Ma Washington actually mentions, you know, this post-mill expectation. And he said those passages were hard to find because he misspelled, like he spelled millennium differently than it usually spelled or something like that. But yeah, there's one of his lectures where he talks about the faith of George Washington. And so apparently even George Washington was in maybe post mill. I don't know. That might be a good or bad thing for some people. You know, it depends 
how you feel about George Washington, but uh, what's clear is um, is that it was very much, you know, um, a part of that whole that whole period. Yeah, and I appreciate you addressing that because we can be, become a very anachronistic. I think that's the word, and we can read mm -hmm. things back into history. So I appreciate you addressing that uh, to make it, making sure our audience doesn't, uh, you know, be, you know confused or led astray by that uh um also what what was that guy's name that you you mentioned uh, i want to write that down Bruce score no one some joaquin de fiore what do you know how to spell that uh jo joaquin i don't know how it's spelled exactly but uh, uh, I'll, I'll just type it in and google will figure it out but you and said I might, Bruce I know, I might be confusing it, right? is yeah Bruce Core has a has a lecture on historicism that's really interesting and really goes into a lot of actually how Joaquin's commentary on and and really method of of interpretation of exegesis because up until that point there was a lot of you know the you know kind of not you know not, not really historical grammatical interpretation let's say and his commentary and his method of interpretation really influenced that historical grammatical interpretation. And it also influenced kind of the historicist view of revelation and a few other things. So he's a really interesting character to, to study. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm definitely gonna, um, I'm definitely gonna have to, to, to look that up. So, and, and so, so right now we're on a decline. What would you say uh, to those who are like the post mill hope can't be true? We're just look around us, man. We're going everything's going to hell in a handbasket. It can't be true. Yeah, well, well, I mean, obviously, um, everybody reads history according to their worldview, right? I mean, that's just that's pretty pretty basic. And so, if things are going bad. Uh, then they go, see, look, things are going bad. We knew it was going to happen. If things are going good, they say, well, you think things are going good, but really this is just, you know, this is just preparing things for kingdom of Antichrist. And you're just being lulled into sleep by thinking things are okay right now. And so, uh, so really it, it doesn't, you know, we shouldn't be led ultimately in our views of things by what we think is going on in the world. Uh, we should be led by the promises of God and, what the promises of scripture ultimately. I mean, so like, you know, Doug Wilson pointed out in my, in my documentary, it's like, you know, you see something like Abraham in the desert, you know, receiving these promises from God. He didn't see any fulfillment of that at that point. You know, it wasn't like he looked or he's in the middle of the desert, you know, it's like, you're going to have, you know, children like, like the, the, the stars in the sky, you know, like he, he didn't see it at the time, but he trusted in the promises and that's what we do. And so, you know, we could, people can discuss, you know, how good, how bad things are. I mean, in reality, it, a, a lot of that, um, I mean, things are objectively very good right now. If, if like, if, if, you know, somebody asked you, okay, um, what point in history would you like to have been born? Like, you know, would you like to be been born in the 11th century uh, would you like to be born in the 15th century, in the first century? I mean, um, yeah, that, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in, happened in history. A lot of, you know, people that, you know, died because one of their teeth got infected, you know, and, and that's it, you know. Um, we have penicillin these days and we have, uh, you know, the ability to do a podcast with someone, you know, on, in another hemisphere. So that's, that's kind of nice. So uh, when people, you know, are saying, oh, these, you know, things are really bad and, you know, th they don't usually aren't really having a very balanced perspective when it, in terms of all of history and all of reality in, in that sense. And so, uh, but even if it really was bad, even if things were really on in decline and, and all that, well, it doesn't matter because God is working through history and, and yeah, maybe, maybe we're going through a dip. Maybe we're going through a hard period, but, uh, 
by his grace and through the work of, of his spirit, we're going to come out victorious, even from this, this you know, difficult moment, I guess. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's really very much a problem for post-millennialism. It's, it's more of, a, of an issue of, are you trusting the promises of God? Are you going to be like Joshua and Caleb, who went into the land and said, yeah, man, let's do it. Or are you going to be like the other spies and said, no, that it's full of giants. We're not going to be able to, you know, after they had seen God part the Red Sea, after they had seen mighty works and miracles and everything God did, they're like, nope, we're, we're here pretty much. We're just, you know, we're almost here. But yeah, this is too much. We're not going to be able to win this one, you know. So it really has to do with are we trusted in the promises of God or not? So many, so many good points there. I don't know where to begin. Uh, but but one I, I need to touch on. Um, the trusting in, in the promises of God and being like the Israelites. That was money. That was money, man. I, I got to steal that for a sermon. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> because we, we've seen um, in our own lives, Jesus change our, our wicked hearts, uh, bring us from death to life. We look back and we see God take the most wicked act in history, the death of his son, and use that to bring about the redemption of his elect. And we've seen throughout history how where the gospel goes, it permeates society like, you know, uh, and it changes things like William Wilberforce in England, uh, stop the transatlantic slave trade because he was a believer in the gospel. We've seen all these things changed, but we get to this point in history and we see the giants and we're like, no, nah, I'm uh, that they're too big. I'm done. So that was beautiful, man. And another thing I want to touch on real quick, you talked about how we have all this technology now and stuff. Somebody may say, oh, that's because of the scientific revolution. It's a secular humanist done that. No, that was brought about by people who, who the, the scientific revolution was brought about by people who actually believed that they presupposed that there was a creator and sustainer of the world and that he made the world in a, a, a logical way. So I, I was recently reading uh, Francis Bacon and I don't, I don't, I haven't read enough of him to know if he, uh, what he held to, if he was post mill, you know, if he had some unorthodox beliefs. But what I did read was him saying, God has ordained that we would increase scientifically and technologically. And that's what drove him to do what he did. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a, a very interesting point there. Yeah, and it's it's to me it's amazing how many times these days it's the non Christians that seem to get it even more than the Christians. You know, I mean, like Richard Dawkins the other day being like, "Yeah, you know, after after you know being the most famous atheist in the world and all of this, he's like, uh, yeah, actually, I'm a cultural Christian, so I I I don't I I believe you know the re religion is all stupid, but." If you're going to be stupid, I guess, at least be a Christian. I want to live with that kind of stupid, not the, you know, the, the, the suicide bomber stupid, you know, I guess, or something like that. And so, um, so he, even Richard Dawkins was, you know, recognizing that, you know, even if he didn't believe this stuff, at least Christianity was the best that we have out there. And another book that's really interesting that a lot of people have read in the last few years is uh, Dominion by Tom Holland, uh, who he, he he's not a Christian as far as I know. And he really, but he goes through and shows how Christianity changed the world and how so many of the assumptions, you know, even a lot of these progressives and different people have these days didn't exist in the Roman world. They didn't exist in, in, in the first century. They, they came through Christianity. And, um, um, and, and so even just, you know, basic ideas of compassion and, and care for the underdog and all this stuff is, wasn't a thing in the world. And, and you have to explain, you know, how did, why, why did the West become so successful compared to other civilizations, you know, even compared to Islamic civilization or Buddhist or Hindu, um, the West, you know, it, 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 
um, the, the technological advances and so many other things were far uh, superior, right? And how do you explain that? Is it just this like, oh, we're just, you know, better or something like that? No, it's because of the gospel. And it's because of the Christian worldview. Now, as we move away from that Christian worldview, we we begin to lose those blessings. We begin to lose a lot of, of, of those, the, those elements. But very clearly, when you go back in history, it, 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 it was the Christian foundation of law and society and the idea of ethics and work and so many other issues that, you know, like Vishal Manglawadi's book, you know, the title is The Book That Made Your World, you know, and he was right about that. Yeah, so I, I looked up uh, Dominion by Tom Holland. Mm -hmm. Bro, I, I had to hold back from laughing because I, I thought you were talking about Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same name, different guy. <laughs> I was like, Spider-Man wrote a book? Okay. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, that was funny. Uh, yeah. But an another thing that you said that I wanted to touch on for our audience is the Abrahamic covenant. God calls Abraham out. And he's like, Abraham, look up. And back then, they didn't have the uh, all the light sources we have blocking our view of the stars. If, if you take an actual a view out in the middle of nowhere, where it's uh, of the, the the stars, when, and when you take a view of that in the middle of nowhere without these light sources, the stars are just all across the sky. And, and God's like, see if you can count those, right? Uh, and He says that's what your descendants will be like. Well, then we go to Galatians uh, three, and it says that all those of faith are children of Abraham. So God's telling us that those who believe in Christ are going to number like the stars in heaven and the sands on the seashore. That's an astronomical number. I've looked it up and can't, I don't even know if I could say that number is so high. And of course, I mean, I know it's an illustration. It's like a, a metaphor, but still like that's a lot of daggum people. Hmm. Yeah. And, it, and it, I mean, if you even think about, you know, what, what God said in his words about, you know, blessing to a thousand generations, you know, how many people is a thousand generations? You know, you do the math with that. That's a pretty, pretty big one. And then also, you know, it's very interesting in Psalm 22, when you're considering, you know, God's promises to Abraham and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In Psalm uh, 22, we have this messianic Psalm, uh, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in the first verse? And it describes the sufferings of Christ uh, very vividly on the cross. But it ends, you know, and it, in a very interesting uh, way, you know, because it, it, it it's basically uh, says in verse 27, right? All the ends of the year shall, shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nation shall worship before you, right? And, and so that really is the expectation based on that Abrahamic covenant, you know, of all the nations are going to be blessed. And the expectation is all the nations are going to turn to the Lord. So it's not just this all the nations are going to be blessed and like, yeah, the world's going to be a little bit better because there's Christians in the world or something like that. It's no, all the, 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 the nations are going to turn to the Lord. That's the expectation. And that's the fulfillment of, uh, the Abrahamic covenant in that sense. Amen. Beautiful. You, you read my mind. I had literally typed in Psalm 22 because that was one of the next things I want to look at. It's one of my, my favorite verses in the Bible. Psalm 22, 27. Yeah. Actually, uh, in my, uh, did you hear my post mail rap? I did. Yeah. Yeah. That was in good. In the beginning, I got Tim Bush on quoting, uh, Psalm twenty two twenty seven. Awesome, yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's an amazing. I love it because it's such a, it's such a short, you know, section. You know, and you could read some of the other verses as well, and it, it describes, um, you know, and what's interesting too is it describes, you know, families and generations and all this, and so it's not, you know, in the eternal because people say, yeah, yeah, but that's for the eternal state. No, you know, families and generations. That's all. In history, right? Jesus was very clear when 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 we get to the eternal state, there's no more families, you know, there's no more marriage. There's, you know, 
you're like the angels in heaven. You know, that's what Jesus responded to the Sadducees. And so very clearly it is just, and the same thing with like Psalm 72, you know, you know, it, may he reign as long as the sun and the moon endure and all this kind of stuff from generation to generation. And it, it's describing like human history. It's not describing post-human or, or after history in that sense. And so, but I love it because nobody can deny that Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm and that it's connected to the sufferings of Christ on the cross. You know, Christ himself quoted it on the cross. And uh, and so if you but if you believe that is true, then you can't just gloss over the end of the psalm that speaks of the after the cross, what's going to happen and what is the fruit of the sufferings of Christ in that sense. Amen. That's right. Beautiful. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Redemption accomplished. It is mm -hmm. finished. Till I stop. He, he's done it, and we're going to spread that to the nations. Beautiful. Exactly. Amen. So I hear you saying all this positive stuff, right? And I, I, I love it. Appreciate it. I'm right there with you. But I know that uh, people in our audience are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about the Olivet Discourse. What about Matthew 24? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I want to kind of just look at it real quick and then um, discuss that so that maybe we can help our audience see it in a different way. Um, and, and as you're you're going there and, and, and looking at it, I want to tell the audience some things. Of number Guys, there's different interpretations of... Um, um, of scripture that deal with end time. So, so uh, there's the partial preterist view, which says that a lot of it has been fulfilled in the past. A lot of our prophecy, that's what I meant to say. Prophecy, a lot of it has been fulfilled in the past. There is the historicist view, which is it's fulfilled. A lot of the prophecies fulfilled throughout history. The futurist view is what is common among pre-millennial and especially dispensational circles where um, Matthew 24 and 25 would be uh, future. And and then there's the idealist view, which uh, most of the time that deals with more of the book of Revelation, but it, basically that a lot of prophecy and maybe even they would take this prophecy uh, in Matthew 24 and uh, just deals with uh, ideas that are general uh, that go throughout history, but my, for the most part, that's uh, for revelation. What we're going to um, explain to you now is the partial preterist view of Matthew 24. And you might find a few differences between partial preterists, uh, but for the most part, this is the, um, uh, the most, I would say the most common view uh, from the partial preterist perspective. Nathan, take it away. Yeah. So basically my understanding of, of, um, um, Matthew 24 would fall within that partial preterist kind of view. And, and it actually, even before I was post bill, I had an interest in this and this topic particularly. So I, I was a partial preterist probably seven, eight years before I was post mill. And, um, uh, and so I've, I, I, I've studied a, a bit of, of this um, subject over the years. And my, my view is that a large part of Matthew 24 um, was fulfilled in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And there's a lot of, I mean, you go to Matthew 23, uh, the context seems very clear, the focus on the temple, you know, a focus on, you know, all these things will happen this generation. And then, uh, you know, go you go to Matthew 24, and the question still has to do with what what's going, what, what were you saying about the temple? Like, uh, and they were a little confused, and Jesus kind of, sets them straight to a certain extent and then that whole section concludes you know and it's truly this generation will not pass away until all these things take place and so clearly uh, jesus was really focusing on issues that were going to happen within that generation 
Now, that doesn't mean he can't talk about other issues. And I mean, they asked him a question and yeah, they probably didn't have even a concept very clear about him even leaving and dying and rising. I mean, we, we see very clearly that they were quite confused about a lot of those things, even when Jesus told them multiple times it was, you know, he was going to die and, and all of that. But my my view is that, you know, after that section, he begins to talk about something else because you know, he says, uh, you know, uh, all these things will take place. It says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And then on verse 36, he says, but concerning that day and hour. And so I take the perspective that he changes the subject at that point. He, he introduced this idea of heaven and earth passing away. And he says, okay, now I'm going to talk about that day when heaven and earth passes away. And about that day and hour, no one knows. And that's, I think this is to me is one of the main and important distinctions is that when you read before most of what we read before Matthew 24, 34, it talks about signs, right? It talks about, you know, when you see this, when you see that, and when this happens, when that happens, know that this is near. But then you get to past that and the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is unexpected. It, it, it doesn't have any markers and signs before it. It just comes, you know, and that is what we see clearly in the in the passages that follow after, you know, verse 35 here. And so it talks about the days of Noah. And notice, for example, when it talks about the days of Noah in verse 37, it's not grabbing on to the fact that the days of Noah were really evil or something like that, you know. And it, 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 it's talking about the suddenness. So even like someone like D.A. Carson in his commentary on Matthew notes that he says the, the point of the comparison isn't that the days of Noah were really evil. And so the final days are going to be real evil. The point is, right, for the in those days before the flood, verse 38, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So the point is, they were eating, they were drinking, they they planned a wedding party that day. You know, there wasn't, it, it, you know, and uh, one point with that is if if things really are blowing up and going crazy on the day Christ returns, like a lot of Christians believe, if you know the there, it's really bad, that wouldn't be a good day to plan a wedding. You know, I don't I don't know about you, but. Planning your wedding when it's like Antichrist is reigning and everything is falling apart, like that wouldn't be a, a great time to plan a party um, in that sense. So w what it seems to, to, to speak to is that, no, that when Christ returns, things are going to be pretty normal. Things are going to be pretty calm and, and uh, you know, it's not going to be a special day in that sense. It's not going to be a a day where everyone's like, oh, this something weird's going to happen today. It's going to be very unexpected. And so that, I believe, is irreconcilable with the idea of, you know, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, run to the hills. Or even verse 32, it says, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gate. And so notice that that example of the fig tree, it's like, look, this isn't going to be, it's not going to be impossible to decipher. Like when you, when you look at a, a, a fig tree and you look at the branches, uh, you, you know, you know, that means something, you know what that means. You, you can discern the times. You should be able to discern the times that these events that I'm talking about are going to happen, Right. But on the other day, it says, no, like no one knows, not even, the, you know, not even the sun. And, and so it's very, so that's why I, I and, and, and you know, guys like Ken Gentry and, you know, others come to that conclusion that it's talking about two different days. And so we don't deny that Matthew 24 is talking about the second coming, but we also believe that it's mostly talking about uh, the destruction of, of Jerusalem in that sense. Right, uh, and I appreciate the uh, the contrast there between uh, what Jesus was talking about that was near and what he was talking about that was far, and the emphasis, um, but of that day, 
an hour. He uses the far demonstrative, um, but he uses the near demonstrative uh, for um, the destruction of Jerusalem. All these things will take place before this generation passes mm -hmm. away. And just to, to help our audience out quickly, I'm going to uh, touch on a few things. Uh, so what Nathan was describing, if you, if you guys would uh, turn to Matthew 23, uh, basically what's happening there is Jesus is correcting and rebuking the Pharisees for being just jack wagons, right? They're constantly challenging him. They won't, <clears throat> they won't um, submit to him and they're keeping others from coming to him. And so Jesus gives them the seven woes. And then at the end of it, at the end of, of Matthew 23, uh, specifically in verses 35 to 36, uh, I'll start at 34. Therefore, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakai, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus there is, uh, he's, he's threatening them, letting them know destruction is, is nigh. It's going down. Uh, then in Matthew 24, they dip, they leave the temple, and then uh, the disciples are, are pointing at the temple and, and you know, and, and Jesus says, truly, I say to you, not one stone will be left upon the other. That's uh, verse two. Then verses. Uh, then there's the questions which are asked. And, and this is what Nathan was talking about. I, I'm, you might see this differently, Nathan, but I, I don't know. But do you see this as two separate questions or one question and Jesus breaks it into two. How do you see that? Personally, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard this whole issue a lot of times, but at this point in, in my, in my life, I kind of don't really care one way or the other. I feel like they, they ask, I mean, I think their question mostly just pertain to what in the world were you talking about Jesus? And they didn't have much of a concept beyond that. Now what che Jesus chose to respond did not necessarily have to be exactly what they asked. And so I, I, to, to right. me, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, okay, maybe it's two, maybe it's one. And, you know, you could compare with Luke and, and Mark and kind of, but it, I don't, I don't at this stage for, for, I don't know, whatever reason, I don't see it as a huge issue one way or the other personally. All right. So I'll, I'll just explain how I'm seeing it. I see it this way. They, they say, tell us when these things will be, what Jesus was just talking about, destroying the temple. And what will be the sign of your coming and I and, and the end of the age? So I take that to be uh, future, the sign of his ultimate return, the sign of the end of the, uh, the, the end of the world. So there's two things. When will these things be? When will the destruction be? And when will the end of the world be? And Jesus um, answers it in in that order, and he's he's telling them, you know, what's going to occur, and just just so that that people um, aren't confused. Um, I'm, I'm not going to exegete all of it. It would take mm -hmm. absolutely all yeah. day. But verses um, five on down to uh, thirty six or 35 is what we're saying the destruction of Jerusalem is because he says uh, in verse 34, truly, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So everything that happens in between there had to come upon that generation. Now you're going to say to me, Jerry, when, when did uh, the moon and the stars fall from heaven in that generation? I'm going to say, go back to Isaiah 13. And read about the destruction of Babylon. The same sort of decreation language is used. Mm -hmm. Anytime you see decreation language mentioned in prophecy, uh, understand that it's referring to destruction, not literal sun, moon, and stars falling from the sky. So, uh, do you have anything that you would like to add to that? 
Yeah, pro well, probably should add because, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very clear the decreation language, as you mentioned, you compare it with the prophets and it's not, uh, it, it's very similar. And so I don't, I, I think it's very easy to demonstrate that that's, that shouldn't be an issue. Besides the fact that we associate that just, we've heard it for, for so long that, oh, that's talking about the second coming, right? And, and get confused over that. But I do want to talk about one part that, that is kind of the fly in the ointment for a lot of people who, uh, who consider the view that I'm taking of dividing Matthew 24. And they say, oh, but, um, you know, um, when you go to, I think it's Luke 17 or Luke 21, uh, Luke seems to mix uh, a section that we find in that 5 to 34 in with the stuff that comes after, right? It, specifically, the stuff about, uh, you know, uh, from for as the lightning comes from the east and shines to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And actually, I, I would grant that those verses are talking about the second coming. But the way, but but the focus there is not on the second coming. It's on what's happening there because it, they say so. If they say to you, "Look, in, in he is in the wilderness," do not go out. If they say, "Look, he is in the inner rooms," do not believe it. And so what? So the focus is during that period, the disciples and others were going to be faced with people saying, "The Messiah is over here. The Messiah is over there." But Jesus says. No, don't be confused. Don't think that the Messiah is going to be hiding in a cave somewhere, right? Like, like, like the you know, like the faithful in the times of Elijah, you know, or they were hiding from from King Ahaz or something, and in this cave, and they're just going to, like, you know, there was kind of even on, with some people this idea that the Messiah was going to be hiding with this giant army and just come out and and defeat his enemies, you know, out of nowhere, basically. And it says, no, no, no. Uh, that's not, no, it, the, when the Messiah does come, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be like light, light, it, lightning coming from the east and the west. You're not going to have to go to some secret room at 11 o'clock at night to, to see that, basically. Everyone's going to see it. And so I do think there is an exception there that, but the focus is still on the things that are happening before 70 AD. It just, it just says, it just contrasts what people are saying with what the reality will be in that sense. And so that's kind of the only, um, the only difference. And that's also a point where Ken Gentry takes that, that view. And Ken Gentry even mentions that he changed his view on that. He used to try to fit that in some way, but he said, no, I think it makes more sense to, to say that it, 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 it is talking about the second coming, those, those few verses right there. So I don't okay, know that, yeah. that that's a bit of a an issue that some people have with with that particular interpretation. So thought I might as well mention it. Hey, I appreciate it. And one more thing I want to mention uh, when it talks about when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by pr the prophet Daniel standing in the holy places. Let the reader understand Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house on and on uh, Eusebius actually uses that to say that uh, the early Christians um, understood what, what Jesus was saying. And when they seen Jerusalem surrounded by armies and, and then they, they, those armies drew back for a little bit, they realized what was going on and they bunked out, they fled. Yeah. And then they came back and destroyed uh, Jerusalem. Yeah, Eusebius actually says that the com that the com the city was completely deserted in terms of the Christians, like all of them left. And there were two opportunities really when um, when they could have fled. You know, um, one was in like you know at the beginning, obviously before they arrived there, and the, the other was like two years into the war when I believe it was. I, I think that was when. Um, when Nero died, actually, like in, in 68, I believe, and uh, Vespasian went back to be crowned emperor and his son Titus stayed with the, the siege, basically, or came back afterwards. So there was a short period in between there where they could have ran as well, you know, uh, or escaped the, the, the destruction in the city. So 
so yeah, there were opportunities to to escape, and that was a very, I think, something very key in the early church. Even when we talk about, you know, we've been preaching at our church through Acts. Even when you see the whole thing where they were selling their properties and giving it to the church and all that stuff, and it was a very temporary situation because of the reality that all these Christians were coming from all over the place, and they didn't, you know, they had just heard the gospel when they happened to be in town for the festival and Pentecost, right? And and so they weren't prepared to stay there and for an extended period of time and and all of that. But also just due to the fact that Jesus had so clearly said, you know, this city is going to be destroyed anytime. And you have to be light on your feet. You have to be ready to run. Obviously, the, the price of real estate, you know, five minutes before the Roman armies invade, you know, your property value is going to go down a bit. So you might want to sell now uh, in that sense. And so that's something else, you know, small detail to consider, too, even when we're reading the book of Acts. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a good point. In Acts 2, when they're selling all their stuff, uh, they weren't socialists. Uh, they were capitalists. They realized, um, you know, this is not this is not going to be good. We need to get rid of this while we can and keep yeah. the money. You know, <laughs> give the money to the church or whatever. So, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Nathan, man, it's been a, a pleasure and truly an honor uh, having you here on the Twitchy Theologian Um Please send me all the links so I can um, uh, get everyone in, in touch with, with all your stuff and, and a place to where they can donate. And, um, yeah, I'd love to have you on again sometime, brother. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Yeah, I had a great time. And, um, uh, yeah, I'd be glad to come again. So, um, uh, so thanks for, for the invite. All right, brother. Well, y'all have a good one. Until next time, grace and peace.